In our final lecture, we shall trace how the postmodern theories of Derrida are played out in the writings of Paul de Man, Roland Barthes, Michel Foucault, and Stanley Fish, as well as in the modern critical schools of new historicism and feminism. Let me mention at the outset that like lecture 22, there is a lot of material. I am going to be moving quickly, so gird up your loins, loins tighten your belt. We're going to be moving and covering a lot of ground. Let us begin with Paul de Man, uh, who's long been at Yale. Uh, he's died now, but he was at Yale for a long time. And Paul de Man is always known as a disciple of Derrida, and he is, but it's ironic because he's older than Derrida, quite a bit, or was older, quite a bit, and he was doing it about the same time, but still Derrida gets the credit for being first. Now, Paul de Man, then, following the lead of Derrida, carries deconstruction into the interpretation of literature. Derrida deals with literature a little bit. Paul de Man is really the one that deals fully with literature. Now, de Man argues that critics are still caught in the aporia of trying to break the code of a text of so unpacking it as to reach a stable meaning. He says, look, here we are, you know, uh, uh, getting in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and we're still trying to break the code. We're still doing this new critical thing. We're still trying to reduce it to a meaning, and we don't realize that it's an aporia. We're caught. We can't do it, but we still try to. We still think there's some stable meaning, some logos in the center of the text. We are still doing, in other words, reductive, close readings that set up a referential structure where inside refers to outside or outside to inside. We think we can match up external and internal and all these things, the structure and texture. That's a kind of a binary. We breaks that down, okay? There is no inside and outside. That's, that's a, again, a logocentric binary that we've created. We don't have this kind of reference that we think we do. We still, Demand says, view the critic as one who reconciles form and meaning, or we might add structure and texture, who opens the text like a Chinese box to release a secret meaning. You all know those beautiful Chinese boxes. You open one and there's a smaller, and you open that and there's a smaller. Well, he says critics are still doing that, like we can keep getting until we get to the C, to the meaning, whatever it is. He says, again, this only leads to aporia. This is not the way to do it. He's deconstructing that. Demand again, rejects this view of criticism and of the critic, this view of the critic, in favor of semiology. Now, semiology is a Greek word. It means literally the study of signs, but I think it's better to think of it as the study of signs as signifiers. Because semiology tends to go in that uh, Deridian direction of the perpetual deferral of meaning. S uh, signs are all signifiers. Signs don't really have meaning. Signs are just signifiers pointing to other signifiers pointing to other signifiers. So, again, in this sense, he's a deconstructionist like Derrida. He believes that uh, what we think is real is just a sign of something else, which, again, is a sign of something else, and so on and so on. Now, he wants to do something different. The reason he likes semiology is because he said... It's not like logic. The trouble with logic is logic posits the possibility of a logos. It's kind of related to the word. Logic always looks for a logos, a structure, reason. Or even in grammar, because even grammar offers the possibility of fixed, unproblematic meaning. So he doesn't want logic and he doesn't want grammar. They're fixed. Instead, he advocates semiology and also rhetoric, because there each sign gives way to another in an endless series of of deferrals. Think about rhetoric. Think about the sophists again. Gorgias was a sophist. What were the sophists able to do with rhetoric? They were able to make the weaker argument the stronger. That's what they accused Socrates of, but it was really the sophists who were doing that. Uh, again, he likes that though. He wants that kind of rhetoric because it allows you to be uh, in stable meaning, back and forth, no fixed meaning. The semiologist who is ever conscious of the slippery, arbitrary nature of language prefers not to ask what words mean, but how they mean. Remember I talked about that before? They no longer believe that words really mean anything. So now we want to find out is how they mean, the system or the structure by which they mean. And that's true really for postmodern too. Let me give you an example that will make it easy. And I'm going to use a nice unpolitically correct uh, ex example. If I went to a deconstructionist and said, comment, here's a s statement. Homosexu homosexuality is a sin. Comment on that. Well, you know what the deconstructionist won't do? He will not worry about truth claims. He will not say that is true or false or right or wrong or moral or immoral. That is irrelevant. It's not, he won't even talk about truth claims. What he'll do is he'll say, well, what do we mean by sin? What kind of referential system are you working in? 
After all, if there's no transcendent signified, what does sin mean if there's no holy God to measure sin against? So, what man-made system of sin are you talking about? What signification system? And homosexuality, well, what is sexuality? How are you defining that? Do you see what I'm getting at? They can drive you crazy, deconstructionists, because you'll never get a straight answer out of them. But they're serious. I mean, to us it sounds like a big joke, but they're serious about it. Because they don't want to posit any fixed meaning. And so you'll go around and around in circles. Now, some people would say that's the case with Plato, but Plato always ends up with the meaning. He plays around to get rid of the untruth so he can get to the truth. Remember the, remember the Socratic method that wipes away the falsehood to get at the truth. Deconstruction doesn't do that. It plays games. It goes around and around, and it can drive you crazy. It's like one of those friends you have that everything you say, they find another meaning for it, so you want to strangle them. Well, a deconstructionist can be annoying like that, but they're serious about it. They want to show you that language is slippery and it can't hold meaning. Who are we to make truth claims? They're not possible, really, anymore. All right, in an essay called Semiology and Rhetoric, and that's sort of what I've been quoting all along here, Demon offers both a rhetorical critique of grammar and a grammatical critique of rhetoric. Now, how does this work? Let's look at the first one, the rhetorical critique of grammar. He carries that out by studying rhetorical questions that seem in grammatical terms to be fixed but rhetorically deconstruct themselves into a state of unresolved suspension. Let's give an example. The rhetorical question, what's the difference? Now that sounds like a very stable, it's only three words, it has a simple syntax. That should have a stable meaning. But if you look at it rhetorically, what could it mean? It could mean, what's the difference? could mean a vigorous intensification of dialogue. What's the difference? Tell me, let's fight about it. Or it could mean an apathetic end to all further debate. Well, what's the difference? You see, even a phrase that seems so stable is instable or unstable. Another example. Likewise, the comment, that was interesting. If I ask you, what did you think about this lecture? And you said that was interesting? It could mean you thought it was the most fascinating thing you ever heard, or you could mean you were absolutely bored to tears. So that phrase, that was interesting, is not stable. It is not fixed in any way. Again, in both examples, common phrases are revealed as inherently unstable. Even simple phrase, not just poetry, not just metaphors and all that, that we can admit are unstable. Even nice grammatical constructions are also unstable. Now, the latter critique, the grammatical critique of rhetoric, here he carries this out by showing how different types of figurative language, metaphors and whatnot, deconstruct each other in such a way as to demystify any aesthetic or metaphysical claims made by the text. See, poets are always saying, we've got the truth, we embody truth, and poetry is written in figurative language. Well, what he does is now he brings in grammar and he shows grammatically and syntactically that metaphoric language also breaks down because there's so many different ways to read it. And so again, it's not stable, it's not fixed, it's not truth. So either way you go at it, it's breaking down meaning. Now, this is funny, in one sense, this is just a radical restatement of new critical irony. In one way, this sounds like irony, right? It's unstable. But there's a little bit of a difference. Demand carries it to a higher level of ambiguity that borders on nihilism, I would argue, and that disrupts any claims the poem might make to truth. He goes much farther, past irony to, I would say, a little bit of nihilism, you know, that, that there's nothing, that there's no meaning. Back to Gorgias, I guess. So, again, and that's something that is still debated. Is deconstruction nihilism or not? That's a debate that's still going on in the academy. Now, actually, Demand is more clever. Demand would say, you know what? It's not really the critic that deconstructs the text. The text actually deconstructs itself. And Stanley Fish, we'll talk about him later, he wrote a, a book called Self-Consuming Artifacts. He believes that language is so unstable inherently that it deconstructs itself. I just help it along. It's, it's already doing it. So do, in other words, what he's saying is, don't blame me. It's like that resistance to psychoanalysis. And then there's a lot of that here. resistance to deconstruction. Don't resist me. The language is doing it itself. I'm just explaining it. You know, that kind of thing. All right. Now, another fun thing about this. Like all deconstructionists, Paul Demon uses puns to deconstruct language and is constantly vigilant that he not freeze meaning or posit a center in his readings of text. He wants to make sure that you don't come along and deconstruct him. He wants to make sure that he never has any fixed center. And that's why deconstruction is so hard to read. To many of us, they seem catty, like they're playing with you, because they won't, you can't pin them down. And they love to use things like parentheses, like the 
they'll write the word signification, but they'll put parentheses around S-I-N-G, signification. I mean, they play with things. It's kind of fun, but it does become a little tiresome after a whole book. But they're always playing because they never want to freeze meaning. In that sense, they're more diachronic than synchronic, if you want to use the language of structuralism. Indeed, as a master player of the game, Paul DeMond is careful not to leave himself open to being deconstructed by another, more clever player. It's a game. And I'll give you an example. When I was at the University of Michigan, I heard somebody give a speech on deconstruction. I didn't understand it because it was half in French. It did not have to be, but it was half in French. Now, the fun thing, though, was after he finished, there was another colleague of his in the audience. He raised his hand, he stood up, and in five minutes deconstructed his colleague's deconstructive essay. That was a lot of fun to watch. It was really a lot of fun to watch. It's a game, and you've got to be clever to keep on top. Very strange little uh, subculture there, deconstruction. All right, let's turn to Roland Barthes. We've heard him before in Lecture 22. Now, although Bart in his early years was a structuralist or modernist, his later writings do have a tendency toward deconstruction or postmodernism. He really goes both ways, as does Michel Foucault. We'll get to him in a moment. So let's look at the postmodern Bart now. Thus, in the tradition of Derrida and Paul de Man, Bart, in The Death of the Author, that's an essay, breaks down or deconstructs the empire or hegemony, if you remember that word, the empire or hegemony of the author. He wants to break down the power that we, we link to the author. He proclaims in his essay boldly the death of the author as the center or origin of the text. The author, he asserts, is born with the text and cannot furnish a final transcendental signified to our interpretation. So he wants to cut off the author and say, he's not, you know, a lot of people say, well, I know what the meaning is. I'll talk to the author or talk to the poet. No, he says that even the poet or the author cannot function as a transcendental signified. He's no end. He's just part of the game himself. He is part of the endless deferral of meaning. Now, this is really a radical assertion of the intentional fallacy. Isn't it the new critic idea that you shouldn't look at the authorial intention? But this goes far beyond the new critics. Because Bart refuses to freeze the meaning of a text or to assign to it any ultimate or secret meaning. So it's like the intentional fallacy of Wimsat, but he goes beyond that because he won't freeze anything. It's not just lopping off the author. He doesn't want to freeze any meaning or give it any secret or hidden or uh, transcendental meaning. According to Bart, a book is but, here's a wonderful quote, a tissue of signs, endless imitation, infinitely postponed. That's another idea of aporia or deferral. You never can get there. Meaning is always postponed. Always already postponed, to use Derrida's favorite phrase. Now, Bart knows what he's doing, because he says this revolutionary move, the death of the author, is finally counter-theological. For to deauthorize the poet is also to deauthorize God, reason, science, and law. So Bart would really agree with my critique in the, in the last lecture of Derrida that when you break down the author as a, as a logos, you're breaking down everything. There's no longer any set system, whether it's God, whether it's reason, whether it's the law or science, are all broken down. Now, what does Bart do? Or, or, um, even more radically, this is the part that I like, this is fun. Even more radically, it deconstructs the very authority of both the literary critic and the English professor who claims to be able to interpret for his readers or students the real meaning of the poem. What Bart says is that the empire of the poet is the empire of the critic and the empire, we might say, of the English teacher. See, if, if, if you know, there, there's no signified, if there's no signified or transcendental signified, what is my job as teacher or critic? So my authority, my hegemony is broken too. Hmm, why would he want to do that? Well, anyway, that's what he's doing in his theory. Now, Bart instead finds the unity of a text not in its origin, the author, but in its destination, in the reader. That's where he starts to posit meaning at the end. Now listen, of course, the new critics would accuse him here of replacing the intentional fallacy with a new form of the affective fallacy. Not the author, but the reader, right? Now, deconstructionists like Paul DeMann and Derrida, on the other hand, they would accuse him of merely shifting the center from author to reader. You get what's happening here? Bart is not as good at the game as Paul DeMann. 
He's a little bit older. He's not as good. He gets caught sometimes. He's not as good at the game. He's not so supple because he grew up with structuralism rather than post-structuralism. So there's a little bit of fun there. But still, I would say essentially it's a postmodern idea, the death of the author. All right. In his proclamation of the death of the author, Bart is one with Foucault. And now we'll get to the postmodern side of Michel Foucault, who, in an essay called Truth and Power, and I was quoting pretty much from that essay in Lecture 22, in that essay, Foucault proclaims the death of the great man theory of history. He says we must rid ourselves of the illusion that an individual consciousness can determine the discursive structure in which he lives. You all know what the great man theory is, the idea that history is propelled forward by these charismatic leaders, Julius Caesar, Mark Anthony, uh, 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 Hitler, uh, uh, Napoleon, all these people. And it also includes women, Cleopatra, uh, Joan of Arc, uh, Queen Elizabeth. So we say great man, but it really includes men and women. It's basically the idea that these strong personalities are what what determine history. Foucault kills that. The person, the consciousness, does not determine history. History, the discourse, determines the person. Remember again, the founding fathers didn't make America. America made the founding fathers. Now, this is important for art because we, from here we get that even the greatest poets cannot achieve a transcendent vantage point that will allow them to create pure poems untainted by the socio-political realities of their time. Again, gone is the notion that Shakespeare is not for an age but for all time. Again, even poets cannot rise above. This is kind of Marxism, but it's taken even farther. Even the poet cannot be a voice separate from his discursive structure. Now, a similar critical belief, this idea that the, the author cannot rise above, the poet cannot rise above his discourse, this is expressed in the writings of new historicism, an influential postmodernist school that, though it uses many of the techniques and much of the terminology of the deconstructionists, is really descended theoretically from Marx, Nietzsche, and Foucault. Now, I don't have much time, but I've got to mention New Historicism because it's very, very influential, and, and it's real big now, and it's been big for a while. Now, to the New Historicist, if I put it in, in a little package, to the New Historicist, the poet is often the least likely source for clues as to what his poem means, for he is as much a product of his discursive structure as is his poem. New historicism is... History just means we look at history in the background. Historicism tends to suggest that history ventriloquizes us. The discourse tells us we can't rise above. Let me give you a best example from my life. I wrote my dissertation on William Wordsworth. I was putting together my dissertation and I showed it to one of my advisors who was a new historicist. He gave it back to me and you know what he said? You're doing a very Wordsworthian reading of Wordsworth here. Now, if I were to say that to one of my students, I would mean that as the highest possible compliment. I would be saying, yes, you understand exactly what Wordsworth is doing. You've been true to him and faithful to what he's doing, and you've explained it to me. But do you know what he meant? It was a criticism. Now, he was a nice guy. He wasn't being cruel, but it was a criticism. What he was saying was, it was kind of incredulously, incredulously saying, wait a minute, you're, you're taking Wordsworth's uh, you know, uh, point of view? You're taking his word for what it means? What do you think you're doing? You can't trust Wordsworth. He's a product of his discursive structure. I mean, this shocked me when I finally realized what he meant by that. At first I thought, oh, thank you. Then I realized, wait a minute, this is not a, crit this is a criticism. Okay? I mean, that's new historicism. Now, to understand a poem for a new historicist, what we have to do is we must pierce through its erasures. Those moments when the poet attempts to elide material realities that disrupt his aesthetic agenda or ideology. In other words, poets, to try to maintain the illusion that they are, you know, pure and disinterested and above, you know, have all these little erasures. They try to erase history. They try to erase material realities and socio-political stuff and all of that, right? Well, the new historicist says, ha ha you can't fool me. Whoosh, I'm going to pierce through that erasure or that illusion and find out what's really going on there. Now, I'm joking here, but if there's one thing that bothers me, it's this. This is something I really balked against in graduate school because, again, I went into graduate school because I loved Wordsworth and Shakespeare and I wanted to learn from them. They were my authorities. What's the, you know, I went there as a, as a, 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 a seminary and we go to seminary to listen to his authorities in the Bible. These are my authorities, these, these people. And here they are saying, no, 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 they're, they're unenlightened. They don't know what they're doing. Let's show you what's really happening. I mean, again, this is something that I would go as far as to say is that it offends me a little bit. 
But this is very, very big in modern academia, and it is all the rage. In, and, and I should say, just in case you're interested, um, the two biggest eras that tend to attract new historicism is the Romantic Age, and especially Wordsworth, and Shakespeare's age, the Elizabethan age, because there's a lot of power structures going on there in politics and whatnot. Uh, but again, new historicism, you should know a little bit about it because it's very influential. All right, let's go to Stanley Fish now. In an essay called Normal Circumstances and Other Special Cases, actually the real title is longer, but that's a short version, Stanley Fish cleverly reworks the theories of Demon, Bart, and the new historicist. That's why I'm leaving him for here. Stanley Fish, by the way, has long been at Duke University, but is just about to leave and go somewhere else. He was offered some phenomenal figure uh, to go somewhere else. But anyway, very, very influential man, Stanley Fish. Now, let's see, and Stanley Fish, is, it's called reader response theory. Let me show you how it works with Demond, Bart, and the new historicist. First, you take Demond's refusal to freeze meaning. You mix that together with the new historicist belief that a text is a product of socio-political realities. And then finally, you throw in Bart's desire to privilege reader over author. And I think you come up with Fish's reader response theory. Let me explain to you what this theory is. Fish deconstructs the traditional belief that a given text has a stable meaning that is accessible to the trained critic. See, a lot of people think, a poem has one meaning, and we've got to get at it. Some people get closer, some people get farther, but there is a meaning if we can only get at it. And maybe we can't reach it, but at least we know it's there. There's a stable meaning to this text. No, no. Fish tells us that there is no literal, quote, common sense meaning to any given text that can be distinguished from a more variable, figurative, aesthetic reading. Oh, no, there's no... Con and by the way, postmodernists hate common sense. That's meaningless. Common sense to them is the bourgeois status quo. They say common sense is just another construct, just like absolute truth is. So common sense has fallen uh, in these modern and postmodern days. Uh, what I'm saying is that Fish denies completely Kant's idea of the subjective universal, that it's true for one person and therefore true for everybody else. Well, what's the, uh, what is the other way to look at it? Okay, what he, he says, what the meaning is, he believes there's a meaning, but this is how he exp explains it. And he's, and he's pretty uh, uh, rhetorically powerful fish. He says, what is perceived to be in the text, that fixed meaning that we cling to, is actually a product of the assumptions we bring to it of the interpretive community within which we read it. So an interpretive community can be, uh, you know, middle class people as opposed to poor people. It can be men as opposed to women. It can be Westerners as opposed to Easterners. It depends, you know, how you define it. But an interpretive community can follow any kind of race or class or gender distinction. But what he's saying is that texts only have meaning within the confines of a certain interpretive community, a community that interprets in a certain way. And so, although a text, be it a complex poem or a simple command, may have, within a given historical community, a stable meaning, within that interpretive community, it might have a stable meaning. But, here's the trick, that meaning will change from community to community. So, it's weird. Fish says, yes, that has a fixed meaning, but only for you. For that community, it has another fixed meaning. And for that community, it has another fixed meaning. By the way, at uh, Duke, do you know that Fish also taught law courses? And I'll tell you, post-structural law is a frightening concept. You think about the O.J. Simpson trial. Post-structural law that says, you know, everything's what we make it is pretty frightening, but that's getting stronger and stronger these days. I tell you, Fish is an amazing man, and, and you can't help but like him, because you can give him any statement. I mean, you can give him the most common sense statement you can think of, and he will give you like that three or four different ways to read it. He is just a master. He is, so yeah, he is the debate coach par excellence. I mean, you give him any statement, he'll show you a thousand different ways to look at it in a bunch of different contexts. So nothing stable there. So he's odd. Fish gives us the illusion of fixed meaning. But it's not really fixed because it's constantly changing. Kind of a, it, in a way, it's very much multiculturalism, if you're familiar with that idea. All right. Along with the increased focus put on class by new historicists, new historicists because they're interested in you know, socioeconomic realities that influence the poet, that's really saying you're in, interested in class, you know, with the, the, the lower class and the middle class and whatnot. New historicists are interested in class. Well, there are other groups called colonial and feminist critics who are interested in race, and gender. Now, we don't have time to go into this in much, but basically, modern theory these days is very influenced by what we call race, 
class, and gender. They're always looking for those things everywhere. That's that sort of political correctness we talk about. And again, they distinguish between one community and another community. Now, such critics, critics who focus on race, class, and gender, seek to break down all binaries that make distinctions between male and female, white and non-white, whatever. They want to break down all distinctions. They want to carve out a place for themselves, a room of their own, to use Virginia Woolf's famous phrase, the right to redefine themselves outside any established structures. So it's Virginia Woolf, but much more than her, even more post-structural. Post even, even Virginia Woolf might be a little bit shocked. Um, but what they want to do is create a space, break down the binary. Now, I don't have much time, so let's just focus on feminism. All right, modern feminists, or I really should say postmodern feminists, it's, it's, it's kind of weird, we use both words, but I, I guess we mean postmodern. Modern feminists believe that all gender differences are societal constructs, part of the discursive structure. What, what separates sort of traditional feminism that just fights for equal rights and the vote from this real modern, postmodern feminist, I don't, many people don't realize this, but postmodern feminists believe that there are no essential differences between men and women. You've heard this argument before. The only reason men and women are different is why? Because we give boys trucks to play with and girls dolls to play with. Now, I will say that anybody who has a boy and a girl, a son and a daughter, knows that's nonsense. But that is at the root of modern feminism. In other words, postmodern or modern feminism, it's the same when we talk about it these days, they are anti-essentialist. They don't believe there are any essential differences between men and women. They despise the book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus which has been one of the biggest attacks on feminism of the last 10 or 15 years, actually, believe it or not, even though it's very popular and non-academic. Now, to show this, because they're anti-essentialists, they always use the word gender rather than sex to speak of men and women, because the word sex suggests essential biological differences between men and women. You may have noticed, everybody says gender now, that's the reason, that's jargon, because if you say sex, that suggests there's a biological difference. They want to say anti no, society makes the differences. I've read feminists who've actually denied the maternal instinct, believe it or not. They say that too is a societal construct. Pretty amazing. Most people don't realize when they say I'm a feminist, very different from what feminism is today. All right, now, just as feminists reject all essential gender differences, so postmodernists in general reject all essential differences between various kinds of writing. Let's come back to poetry and aesthetics. This is why postmodernists tend to use the word text. You notice I switched to text this lecture? The French equivalent is écriture. It means almost the same as text. They use text to describe all forms of writing. Now, everything's a text. Why? Behind the word text lies at least three things. First, a refusal to privilege poetry. No longer will they accept poetry as some higher thing. Everything's text. Poetry's not better than prose, better than letters, better than anything. It's all text. Another reason is it rejects the hegemony of the author. No special poet is prophet. It's just text. And finally, it, it captures the belief that all writing, and I mean from the Bible to pornography, every kind of writing, every kind of text, is a cultural product with no separate aesthetic existence. Everything's a text, and everything can be studied. I mean, you can write on Gilligan's Island as much as you can write on Romeo and Juliet. It's all text. Indeed, at the heart of text-based theory is a rejection of the long-held belief that there are a core group of literary works, the canon, that possess an inherent timeless truth and beauty that transcends the historical period in which they were created. They are anti-essentialist, and so there is no canon. There are no works that are essentially aesthetically superior to other ones. Isn't this ironic? I am ending my con very canonical survey of literary theory with the postmodern assertion that the canon is just a social product. To quote an old cigarette ad, you've come a long way, baby. I'll let you figure out my tone. All right, I want to thank you for joining me. There's been a lot of information here. I hope it will affect the way you read. And let me give you an invitation. If you're ever in the Houston area and you can find your way to Houston Baptist University, come look me up. I'd love to talk to you. I enjoy speaking about literary theory. I think it's very important. And I think it really determines not only the way we read literature, but really the way we view ourselves, our world, God, and everything. So again, I want to emphasize this is not just ivory tower. Think about what we've talked about in these 24 lectures. They do have a bearing on the way we live our lives. Again, thank you, and I hope to speak with you someday.